All right, so our next speaker is Kelly Matson from Oxitec. And if you read the company's website, you may get really mad at insects for all the bad things that they do. Um, she's going to talk about uh, using sterile uh, members of one species to uh, try and inhibit reproductively active members of the same species using some technology that they've developed, which is pretty cool. So her, her talk is entitled Genetic Control of Mosquitoes. I would just like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. I did my PhD here in California, and I'm very pleased to be back. The sun is out. We have the wettest winter on record in the UK this year, and that's hundreds of years of record. So um, I'm pretty happy to be here. I want to just start by saying who we are. We're a spin-out company from Oxford University. We've been around just about 12 years now, um, but we work quite globally. So both our funding sources and our collaborators are truly from all over the world. And we've just got to the phase in the last few years um, of field trialing and progressing through the regulatory process that Maria was talking about earlier in several countries. And before I really get started, I want to point out that we couldn't be where we are without our collaborators. And I especially want to focus on um, Angie Harris and Bill Petrie in, from Grand Cayman. So they're mosquito control unit worked with us for our first field trial. And currently we have field trials going on in Brazil with um, Margareth, who's at the University of Sao Paulo, and Aldo Malavasi, who runs a, a group called um, Mosca Med, which traditionally has worked with Medfly, but is working with us a lot. So what do we do? We work with insects, as he mentioned already, and we work primarily on insect-borne diseases and on crop pests. So today, I'm fully going to focus on dengue control in Aedes aegypti, but we do have other targets we're working with, and we aim to reduce insect populations that cause problems globally using a genetic approach. So traditionally, we're spraying pesticides, we're trying to do biocontrol, and we're, we're trying to use GM in the field, outside, um, releasing insects to, to do this work. So it's pretty exciting, but it's also pretty groundbreaking from the perspective of being outside and not being GM plants. So we think our approach is safe and economical and applicable to a lot of species. The challenge I'm going to talk about today is dengue. So dengue, as you heard just a tiny bit earlier, is a very serious disease that impacts a lot of people around the world. About two-thirds of the world population lives in regions that are impacted by dengue. So if you look at all these yellow countries on the map, they have dengue currently. And actually, if you were to imagine, Florida also occasionally has dengue. So it is starting to impact the US again. It was super well controlled in about the 50s because DDT was being used to control these mosquito populations. And you could control mosquito populations and control disease because female mosquitoes bite, they take a blood meal, and then they lay eggs. If you're infected with dengue and you get a bite, and then she goes around, lays her eggs, and bites somebody else, she spreads disease. So if you can r drop these populations below this disease threshold, you can control disease. So that's what we aim to do. Because this represents an enormous economic burden for these countries. So these are developing world countries. And what the money we're spending on disease control, they're not spending on bringing their economies up out of poverty. And so we think this is a really important global problem, you know, locally in these countries for these people, but also for everyone to develop our world economically. Currently, this is what dengue control looks like. Vector control is dengue control. And the state of the art is spraying pesticides through neighborhoods and around homes. It's looking for larval habitats. They breed in water. So this, this guy up in the corner here is actually looking for mosquito larvae so that he can dump the water out. That's how we're controlling this disease right now. And what we suggest is we can do this genetically by the release of sterile insects. So normal course of breeding process, male meets female, female lays eggs. Eggs give rise to the next generation of blood-sucking, biting females that spread disease. If we can make a male who, when he mates with a female, suddenly the next generation just doesn't exist, through successive releases, you can reduce insect populations. Each generation, there are fewer and fewer insects that can bite and spread disease. Sounds kind of radical. Actually, this is a very old idea. It's called the sterile insect technique, and it's been used extremely successfully to suppress several kinds of pests. The best known example is actually really pertinent to the US. The New World screwworm used to be a huge problem for cattle breeders. These, these insects would lay eggs and wounds. It would kill cattle. And what we did is we irradiated enormous numbers of these and dropped them out of planes to control them. So they mate. The populations go down. This is actually a plane dropping screwworm. And, and your populations are reduced. We eradicated all the way through Central America to the border of South America for this pest. Also for California, the Mediterranean fruit fly, there are current sterile insect releases going on. But these are all done with radiation. So this is proven. It does work. 
it works with radiation, and it's species specific. So because you're releasing insects of a given species that go out and mate with their conspecifics, you're not impacting every insect in the area. When you spray pesticide, you're actually killing everything that's out there. We're trying to avoid that and trying to specifically target our insects. And because these are like heat-seeking missiles, these males go out and hunt out females, they're really good at mopping up the last few that are in the environment. So this is important because for disease to spread, it's actually low numbers of pests that can sustain disease. So you really need to eradicate as low as you can, so below this disease threshold. We can use simple mastering techniques to, to breed large populations of insects. We've had really good luck with that. And that statement that says IPM compatible means for a sterile insect technique, you can spray ahead of time if you have to. If you're in a disease emergency, you can spray, and then you can go in with our technology, and they'll work in tandem to help reduce your vector population. So this already works with the radiation. Why are we bothering? Well, the reason we're bothering is if you can imagine irradiating to the point where all of your gametes are destroyed, that's going to have some effects. And these insects that are irradiated are just not very healthy. So you have to release an enormous number of insects to outcompete the insects that are already out there. And so we think doing this with genetic modification, you can actually reduce the, the knock-on effects from how you're sterilizing. So we'll release, reduce, excuse me, we'll release healthier insects that mate more successfully, and we can do this at lower cost. Additional things we can do with genetic modification are things like sexing strains. It's always the females, as far as we can tell, creating problems. They're destroying crops. They're spreading disease. So if we can selectively get rid of females, that's an additional benefit. We're always marking with a fluorescent marker so we can see if our insects are mating in the environment. We can monitor our trials. So we think using our technology, we can bring these sterile insect technique you know, lessons and, and successes to even more insects through the, throughout the world. So how do we go about this? What we release currently is a bisex lethal strain. So this green fellow here is a homozygous male. He carries a lethal trait. He mates in the wild, and no progeny come out of this mating. That sounds great, but if he's carrying a lethal trait, homozygous, how is he alive? Our systems have to be repressible. If they're not repressible, we can't breed successfully in the lab. And we also worry about when do we want them to die. When we're talking about a mosquito, the larvae are innocuous. We want them to live in the environment. We want them to grow big and tall. We want them to eat as much food as they can and then die right before maturity because then they maximally impacted everybody wild that's out there but still died before actually causing any problem. For an ag pest, you'd think differently. It's the larvae in the fruit, eating the fruit, doing the damage, and you'd like them to die, preferably pretty much as soon as they start, maybe as an embryo, and in that way, you reduce your damage. So there's a lot of considerations in how we engineer. I also briefly mentioned that female-specific would be desirable for a lot of these. If we're gonna be releasing insects, we only want to release males. I can't go around in a dengue endemic country and release loads and loads of females. That just increases your disease problem. So we need a way to sort. And if we can do sorting genetically, it saves money. We're using insect synthetic biology approaches to do so. This is a very standard definition. This is actually one from one of our research councils in the UK, but it, it matches what you're all very familiar with. We design in levels of, abstra of abstraction. So I've talked to you just recently about the insect by insect level, but we think about molecular levels, we think about modeling levels. Standardized parts are very important for us. When we think about engineering across insect groups, you don't want to be re-engineering every piece every time you change insect. You'll never be able to address all the problems that you'd like to. And modular parts, so we can just drag and drop functional groups in, into different genomes. And all of our stuff is translational. So while we do part development, it's all to get applications out into the field. So again, here's our individual level. The first question is, how do we get this to happen in the lab? How do we have a male mating a female giving rise to no progeny? And our favorite part is the TED-OFF feedback loop. So TTA is a protein that in the presence of tetracycline cannot bind its operator, but in the absence of tetracycline binds TETO. So that's what you see here. TTAV is binding to TETO, giving rise to more of itself. This is a feedback loop that sets up and eventually get, kills the cells that it's expressed in. It simply screws up transcription to the point where the cells die. However, if we put tetracycline in the diet of the insect, you can break this loop and you, you can survive. So this is how we keep our males alive. We continually feed this cheap, easily sourced drug and our males are alive. And then once we remove it, they'll die. You can also set this up as a two-component system. So if I want to do this sex specifically, I pick a promoter or I pick another cassette that's female specific, put my TTA under this control, 
It, gives, it binds to its operator, TETO, and some effector that kills or that is a fluorescent protein is expressed, and we get our effect. Again, feeding tetracycline represses this loop, and we can carry on breeding our insects in the laboratory. So to actually put together one of these systems in an insect, especially looking up in the corner at a female-specific expression of the system, we need a lot of parts. We need promoters. We need this two-component con uh, conditional system. But we need sex control as well. So that can be accomplished with a promoter, as I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute. But we also use um, splicing to, to carry this out. So in a lot of our insects, we've exploited the sex determination pathway. So what this is is the promoter is the same, the transcript's the same, but the mRNA is spliced differently in males and females. So on the top, we see the female-specific splice form. You have a start code on. It's an open reading frame. You hook up any effector you want downstream of these cassettes, and you can kill. Whereas in males, you start out the same because your splice form is different. You incorporate stop codons, and you never get your effector molecule. So this is another way to tune a system. It's not part of the systems I'm going to talk about today, but listed there are the other insects that we're currently working in that we do have nice alternative splicing systems working in. There are a lot of limitations we're fighting against with this. So you haven't heard a ton of insects out there being engineered and released into the wild, and part of that is there's just not a lot of available parts. So one of the things we really struggle against is we need really high on-off rates. So when our system is repressed, we need these insects to be healthy. We have to rear them in enormous qualities, quantities in the lab, and if they're not high quality, you simply won't be able to maintain your populations. And then when you de-repress the system, you need everyone to die. You can't have 50% killing. You know, you need, under climate conditions that are variable in the wild, under you know, every kind of length of rear, you need everything to die. And so this on-off rate is really important. And we don't have a lot of systems that have that behavior. Additionally, there just aren't a lot of defined components. So we work on building a repertoire, more promoters that work across more species, synthetic elements. We worry about where it integrates. So currently, we're heavily reliant on random integration. And that means you don't have control about what's your nearest neighbor, other genes that are influencing um, transcription and translation and everything associated, you know, transcripts reading through. It's, it's just a bit of a fraught process. And also, I talked about fluorescent markers. We have marker cassettes. We have functional cassettes. They're all talking to each other because they're all very closely positioned in the genome. And so all of these things we have to engineer around. And then across species, we don't want to be doing this again one at a time. So the more our parts can function across species, the better. All right, so let's look at some of what we've actually done. So this is a, the two-component system I showed you earlier. We have a promoter called actin-4. Actin-4 is specifically expressed in the flight muscle of females. And then we've hooked it up to this TETO element, driving it an effector that just, just for fun is DS red. So what we expect here is females, when they're not fed tetracycline, to express DS red in their flight muscle. And that is, in fact, what we see. So on the bottom, you'll have to trust me, the, the mosquitoes autofluoresce very nicely. The males are showing no expression of the DS red. And in the top left, that female is being fed tetracycline in her diet. And so she's also not expressing DS red. But when we derepress by not allowing her access to tetracycline during her rear, she expresses DS red very highly in her flight muscle. So this is nice. We have a female-specific repressible system of expression in mosquitoes. So we moved on to what we would call a real effector, something that's actually going to impact a tissue. So these males are, ho are homozygous for a gene that is actin-4 driving an effector that should ablate the flight muscle in female. They've been raised without tetracycline, so if it was on, they would have a problem. But as you can see, they fly quite nicely. They look like mosquitoes. That's all very good. These are their, their siblings, females, also raised without tetracycline. So their flight muscle is expressing high levels of VP16, which is ablating its function. So they can walk, they can even do a little hopping, but they can't fly. So what this means in the wild is, they're pretty much toast. So these females can't take a blood meal. They can't fly around to find a mate. They can't lay eggs. So they're dead ends. So this is a way to genetically sex our mosquitoes. And it looks, looks quite good. So what I've shown you is that at the individual level in the lab, we can engineer these traits. We can make a line that behaves like we predict it should behave. But that's not really what anyone's interested in. If I go into a country with that, they say, what's that going to do for me? And so what we need to show is that we can control your vector population using this kind of technology, and if we control your vector population, we can control your disease problem, and we can do it cost effectively. And so there's a lot of modeling that goes around this, but of course we have to prove ourselves, not just with models, but with actually showing effects. So just like any company, 
we have phase testing. We start with contained use. So the stuff I've all just talked about is, is just testing of phenotype. There's a lot of other testing that goes in before it'll ever be allowed into the field. It's about knowing exactly what your molecular characteristics are, where it's located, how these insects behave with other insects similar to them. So will they mate with other insects of the same species, of related species? We need to show little cage suppression trials. We get that far, and then we can move to semi-fields. So we take our insects into countries, compete them for mates against the insects that are already there, and see how we do. And once we've satisfied everyone that we think we're a go, we move on to open field trials. So I'm going to take you through some of these phases. So those flightless females I just showed you, we took them to Colorado. And in Colorado, um, Bill Black's lab at Colorado State set up some stable wild type population cages. You can see on the left, all the cages look roughly the same. And at where the black line is, males, homozygous for the female flightless trait, were released into these cages. And within 20 weeks, all the cages had completely been eradicated. So we validated our models. We showed that our technology would work, at least in a cage setting like we said it would. Um, and, and we were pretty pleased with that. So what I've shown you is that technically, we can get these strains to work. But there are two other big components that have to be satisfied before we go anywhere with this technology. And the first Maria touched on is regulatory. Without permissions from governments and municipalities, there's no going anywhere. And a lot of countries aren't even prepared to answer the question of, do we want this technology? Either their constitutions say there's not to be any GM, or there's no framework at all to evaluate the safety of these products. And so that can, can kill your technology right there. You can't move into a country if they can't evaluate your technology. So that can be quite a slow step. Although we've done good work and we are releasing a couple countries. And the other is community engagement. So you want the people that you're working with to know what you're doing and to understand why you're there. So we do a lot of meeting in these communities. In the, the middle picture there that's mostly dark, let's see if this mouse will work. We're actually showing a line of insect eggs. We're showing how transformation happens. We're talking about what the constructs are. We're showing pictures and images. So it's completely open about what we're doing why we're there. We are on TV. We're on the radio. Um, sometimes we're quite exotic in the locations we are. Um, we learn a lot about cultures. So these are actually pictures from a festival in Brazil. Going to community festivals is one of the best ways to communicate to the local people what you're doing. Who are we? Why are we here? You know, do you want us here? Do you understand what we're doing? So there's a lot of work that goes into that. We're in, this is a rearing facility, so we hire locally. These are materials that are taken around to houses. When we're doing these trials, obviously, we need to monitor everything that's happening. We're in houses doing aspirations. There's a lot of communication and a lot of participation from people in the community to make these trials work. And this actually is one of my coworkers. The uh, release strategy is pretty straightforward right now. I sit in the back of a truck with a bucket full of mosquitoes, and away they go. So. Now, I've shown you we can get regulatory approval. We can get the approval of the community. And we technically can achieve what we want to. So let's do some field trials. This was our first trial in Grand Cayman in 2010. So I want you to focus on the green line, which is our control site. So everywhere we go, we monitor a, a similar site to understand what is normally happening with the population compared to what's happening in our release area. And this shows a very normal Caymanian rainy season. So when the rainy season starts, mosquito populations balloon. So that green line shows a nice upward tra trajectory. And around May, June, we started releases. This is a bisex strain. So it's not the female specific strain I showed you. These are males that when released, all of their progeny die. So we start releases. And what we see is the rainy season kicks off. And our population declines in our control area. So this decline is actually limited by migration. So area A, our release area up here, is adjacent to an equally populous area, Area B. So we knew we were having a lot of females just traipsing across that line, not following the, the principles of our trial whatsoever and laying their eggs. Um, but still, the trial was a really good success. We got through regulatory. We did the releases we expected to. We saw our mosquitoes competing in the environment, and we saw suppression. So we were quite pleased with that. And since then, we've moved on to Brazil. So this, I apologize to every scientist, which is pretty much everyone in here, about this graph. And the field team's going to hear it when I get back. Ignore these blue lines for a minute, please. We're comparing the white bars to the black bars. So these are areas before and after treatment. And we're comparing the control area to the untreated area. So what you'll notice is when you go into a community and you say, 
I would like to control your mosquito population. Let's do a trial. They find the most infested neighborhood they can find, and they set you up. So this is the same data you saw for Cayman. We started with roughly twice as many mosquitoes in the control area as in the, I mean, sorry, in the treatment area as a control area. In Brazil, they did us one better. They found something with nearly five times as many mosquitoes in their treatment site as in their control site. And what we can see is several months after releases start, we get a really enormous reduction in the number of mosquitoes that we're observing. So there, it's actually quite tricky to quantify how many mosquitoes you have in an environment, especially when you're releasing hundreds of thousands of males. So looking at how many eggs you're trapping in your overtraps every week is about the best way we've found to look at it, although you can do female trapping. The data look quite similar, regardless of how you do the counting. But what we've established here is in the east end, it's a semi-urban area. Itaberaba is an enormous metropolis where we've just, just treated a small corner of it. And Mandakaru is a tiny isolated village. So it's controlled with two different control sites because we wanted to make sure we weren't just picking a village that didn't happen to have any mosquitoes or, or had an enormous population. So what we can see is in these multiple environments, we have a really nice effect of suppressing the mosquito population. So what I'd like to sum up with is we've shown we can do this. Our riddle releases, our males, are effective in controlling a wild population. And this was all done without any spraying, without any larvicide, without any other kinds of control. So this was to demonstrate efficacy. If we were going into a community, we might start by trying to get their populations under control ahead of time, maybe starting in the serious dry season, other ways to, to help ourselves out. But for demonstration, it was really important to show we could do it on our own. We don't need any help. Um, we got suppression in pretty, pretty short time scales. Mosquito eggs persist in the environment for months after they're laid, so it does take some time for all of the ones that are out there to hatch and, and get our treatment, if you will, before we really get control, but we, we managed to do it. And in Cayman, we've been monitoring post-release, and we saw that populations rebound, but slowly, because again, our eggs are still in the environment a little bit, and so they, they take time to, to d disappear. Public approval was a big thing for us, and what we found, a little bit to our surprise, being in Europe, having such a nervous population about GM, we were worried that it just wouldn't be acceptable technology. And what we found is when you have an intended goal that is really near and dear to the hearts of the people you're working with and where there aren't better solutions out there, they really want your technologies to come into their countries. They want to work with you. They want to be safe, but they want to try it and see, is this risk worth the reward, you know? It's important to them to control dengue, and one of the best thing you have to offer them is, oh, well, when you're having a really bad epidemic, we can do some spraying. That's just not good enough, and so they're really interested in what we have to offer. But that's going to vary everywhere. Our agricultural pests will be a different situation than dengue control, but we hope to show that this technology is safe and that it really can solve problems that people are having. And lastly, I wanted to, to just talk a second more about regulatory approval. Again, it can be a difficult road, but we have gotten regulatory approval in several countries, and there are quite a few more on the books, and we're working with the FDA now to try to work in Florida. So we are making progress. We are getting into countries, and so you shouldn't be too afraid to try to get your stuff out into the field because with good communication, it's really possible. So that, I'd like to say thank you and take any questions. Uh, in your, the last set of field trials, did you look to see in your egg traps how prevalent your construct was in those, in those eggs? Were you able to monitor that? Yeah, that's actually a really important metric we use to tell how well we're doing, how much mating are we getting. So I don't have that data with me here, but we usually like to see the, what we call the overtrap index, so the pr presence of our gene in these egg traps to be over 50%. That's about how high you have to get before you start getting control. Question over here, but while while you're going there, the genetic stock that you're using for your males, it does it is what is it from, and and why would the females not be resistant to not wanting to breed or? So, um, Aedes aegypti is native to Africa, and the rest of the global population seems to be largely very, very similar. So we take ours and we compete them in Malaysia, we compete them in Panama, and we see that generally we don't have any mating competitiveness problems, and we think it's just because it's invasive pretty much everywhere that we're working. They're really similar. So you mentioned that in your Cayman trials you saw a recovery of the natural population, but only slowly. I mean, have you, um, have you ever seen that recovery not happen? And do you envision any scenario where you're not tied to basically forever releasing 
Uh, it's terrible mosquitoes. So we haven't done a ton of trials. Um, we're still working in Brazil, and so most actually, so Cayman's the only place that we've released and then actually stopped releasing so far. So we haven't done a lot of monitoring. It is possible with these strategies to do eradication, but given that there's so much migration from adjacent areas, it's hard to imagine that they wouldn't be able to recolonize. Even with pesticide, they had eradication, and eventually it did come back. Oh, shout. So we have a completely different strategy, right? So Wolbachia seems to be something that can be transmitted horizontally through these mosquito populations and vertically, and seems to not allow dengue to at least get to salivary gland and be transmitted. We take the approach that we don't want anything to persist, persist in the environment, so ours is meant to go away. So that's one big difference between ours and Wolbachia. Um, the other is it's not really clear yet with Wolbachia how stable it's going to be. So they've had some trouble with their trials and keeping it into the population because it's obviously asking the insect to do something beyond which it normally does. And so there's quite a lot of work. It's, it's a competing strategy. It's, it seems to be working in some places, but I think they're kind of like us. We're still in trial phases, um, and we've had good, clear successes, and hopefully they'll get there. All right, thank you.